16th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. <coughs> Beginning there in verse 1, the Bible says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this a beautiful day that you have given to us, a time that, Father, we can come together, those that love you, those that have given their life to you, Father, that we might worship in spirit and in truth. Father, I pray. That in this hour, that as we preach and sing the songs and pray, Father, that we might meet the needs of those here today. That we might minister to them. That we might preach a word that the Spirit would use to touch their heart, to answer questions. And, Father, draw them closer to Jesus Christ. Father, <coughs> as we come together, may we lift up Jesus, that men and women and boys and girls will be drawn unto him. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This chapter begins telling us about the publicans and the sinners who were drawing near unto Jesus to hear him, the Bible says. I want you to understand something this morning, that Jesus could always draw a crowd. Jesus offered hope. Jesus offered healing. Jesus offered forgiveness. My friends, it's no different today. Because Jesus continues to offer healing and hope and forgiveness. <clears throat> you know, I remember those days long, long ago in my life when I first started preaching. Those early years. Those days were exciting. I can still remember back in the hills of eastern Kentucky. Those revival meetings that we would have uh, back then. Yeah. I want to tell you something. Those revival meetings all up and down the big sandy river. Uh, we used to have an evangelist from up in the mountains of Virginia that would uh, work all day, drive in a bulldozer, and then he would come down and he would preach uh, those revival meetings, most of those revival meetings for us. It was a man by the name of Jim Hill. He would drive a long way to be with us, and I can still remember he didn't come. He didn't preach sermonettes to Christianettes. But he preached revival <laughs> meetings, and he preached possibly for as much as an hour sometime. And I want to tell you something about those meetings. The building would be full. Yeah. Every meeting we would have, and oftentimes, if you didn't get there on time, you would be standing on the front porch. Mm -hmm. People were excited. People were on fire. And like I said, he didn't preach sermonettes. He preached the Word. And uh, he preached something that was going to shape and mold the affairs of your life. And on top of that, there were souls being saved. People were being reached with the gospel. I often refer to those as the glad times and the glory days. It was a time of great joy. People were thrilled. People were excited about being in the Lord's house. The churches were strong up and down the Big Sandy. They believed in something. They believed in the Word of God. They took the Bible and the Bible only. They didn't want some soft, soap, feel-good message to tickle their ears. They didn't want to hear something like that. They wanted to hear the unadulterated truth, something that was going to change their lives. Those people were on fire back in those days. It impacted my life. It impacted my preaching. It impacted who I was as a young evangelist. In the 15th chapter, this is one of the great chapters in the Bible, and I'm going to tell you why it's a great chapter, because it hits hard. But at the same time, it shows us something. Not only is it a strong uh, treatise to us, but it is also a, a word of love and mercy and grace. We can see the very heart of God in this text. Now we're going to begin there, and we're going to go through pretty much the chapter in its entirety. The Bible says, And Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man, talking about Jesus, Receive the sinners and eateth with them. I mean, think about it. The thought of this. Here is Jesus, the very Son of God, and he is receiving sinners. Well, of course he is. I want you to notice this account here. 
Beginning there in verse 4, notice what it says. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he lay it on his shoulders, rejoicing. When he cometh home, he called together his friends, his neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. The Bible says, if he lose one of them. Jesus said it like this, for the Son of Man come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now I want you to hear something this morning. I want you to notice something about Jesus Christ. Jesus is all about going after the one. Amen. Amen. Did you hear that? I mean the one. It's nice to be with the saved, to worship and to fellowship. We ought to rejoice in that. This is wonderful. He doesn't get any better than this. But there's a call upon my life. There's a call upon your life, Christian. And that is to go after the lost. Yeah. The Bible says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. This is what Jesus said. He said, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. These are our marching orders as Christians. We are to go after the lost. We are to go after the broken. That's the call that is on our life. I was talking about Jim Hill. Jim Hill's the one that, I suppose, coined the phrase. He came to Marshall and he preached for us a couple of messages, or a couple of revival meetings many, many years ago when I first came back up here. But I can still hear him. And I can still hear him say this. He said, I'll tell you what they're doing in these churches today. He said, they're using goodies, gimmicks, gumdrops, and gadgets to try to draw people. He said, it is the word of God. It is the gospel that draws men unto him. We're supposed to preach the gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says this in Romans in chapter 1 and verse 16. For, it is, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You know, we can attempt to use a lot of things to draw people, but it is the word of God. It's the message of hope. Yeah. It's a yeah. message of salvation. You know, that's what really matters in the final analysis. When day is done and the smoke is cleared, it's all over with. You come down to the last day, the only thing that's going to matter, it's not the games we play or the things that we use to entice people, but it's your relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Have you given your life to the Lord? Are you a Christian? Are you born again? Do you have the hope of eternal life? I'll tell you what. We were talking earlier there. It was said to me, talking about holding his hand or him holding your hand. That's what matters. You're going to go through a lot of stuff in this world. But is God holding your hand? Are you holding his hand? Because God's going to see you through. God's going to take care of you. Yeah. <laughs> this other stuff isn't going to help you one bit. But I'll tell you what, the power of the gospel, your relationship with God, is what's going to make the difference. Jesus said he wasn't satisfied with 99%. Did you notice that? <coughs> he wasn't satisfied with 99%. God, he doesn't want anybody to be outside of Christ. He doesn't want anybody to be lost. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but as long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Years ago, I remember preaching down there in that little church in that coal mining junction. And one Sunday morning, a boy, he walked into the building that Sunday, that Lord's Day morning. And uh, he had stringy hair. His clothes were tattered and worn. And I suppose in some people's mind, he looked pretty rough. Well, maybe he did. But what bothered me was there were those that were sitting there, and I could see them kind of talking amongst themselves kind of murmuring. And what I come to find out that many of those people were more concerned about getting that stranger, that young boy, 
to the barber that they were the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now there's something wrong with that. Hey, yes, they are. Because that's not how Jesus Amen. worked. That's not the lesson that he's teaching here in the 15th chapter of Luke this morning. But I'm going to tell you what happened. That morning we preached the gospel just like we always preach the gospel. And that boy became a Christian. That boy obeyed the gospel. We baptized that boy into Christ that morning. But that's not the end of the story. That Sunday evening he came back. He marched into that church building. And he brought with him his five sisters and a friend. Amen. Mm -hmm. We preached the gospel Amen. again. And that night we baptized his five sisters and his friend into Christ. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's what it's about. Yeah. That's what we are here for. We're not here to judge people upon their appearance or who they are or where they've been or who they were. We are here to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with them that God would take that life and redeem that life and change that life. Amen. Yeah. The Bible says, and go after that which is lost until he find it. He searched until he found the lost land. He looked behind every thicket, bush, every mountain until he found it. I don't know where you've been hiding, but God is going to search until he finds you. Yeah. Yeah. Because he loves you. And Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. The Bible says, and when he had found it, he laid on his shoulders rejoicing. Boy, here's a word. <laughs> He's going to carry you. Did you hear me? You may be broken. You may be hurting. You may be lost. But when he finds you and you obey the gospel, he's going to pick you up and he's going to carry you. Mm -hmm. Friends, you can't make it without him. Amen. You can't make it home without him. He Amen. knows the way and he's the strength and the very one who's going to pick you up and he's going to carry you home to glory one day. We need Jesus. Our sins are greater than we are. Our issues, our problems, our brokenness is greater than we are, and we need Him. Amen. Because He's the only one that can take you home. The second thing is, you're going to notice here, I'm going to read verse 8 to you. The Bible says, Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle, sweep the house, seek diligent, till she finds it. Now we're going to talk about the lost coin. Now, first of all, we're going to learn something here. A coin is an inanimate object. I mean, even I can figure this one out. That coin didn't know it was lost. Yeah. That's right. You're right. But you know what? A lot of people don't know they're lost. There's a lot of people that today do not realize they're lost. They do not realize the direction they're headed. They do not realize that there is a hell out there. And unless they give their life to Christ, that's where they're going to end up. They don't know it. Now, have you ever noticed that nobody goes to hell anymore? Yeah. Now, I picked up on this several years ago. Uh, at least, that appears to be the consensus. Now, why do I say that? Because, you know, when someone dies, everybody believes that that loved one has gone to hell, no matter who they are. Yeah. They may have had total disregard for God. They couldn't care less about their soul's salvation. But when they die, they all go to hell. I've got news for you. Hell is not open. <laughs> it's still open for business. And people are dying without Jesus Christ every day. And they're lost. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. And that has not changed. I heard this old story. I've told this over the years a couple of times. Uh, stories about O. Andrew Jackson. Maybe you remember Andrew Jackson? Remember your history? Well, according to the story, I don't know if it's actually true or not. I suppose it is. It's told to be true. But he stopped by an old country church one night, and he walked in with his entourage, and they <coughs> went in and sat down, and someone called the preacher and said, hey, you know who that is? He said, that's, that's Andrew Jackson. You make sure you make a big deal out of that, and you recognize him. Well, this old country preacher, he got up there, and he did this thing. He said, I've been told that we have been blessed with the presence of Andrew Jackson tonight. But I must remind old Hickory, if he doesn't repent, he's still going to hell. There you go. <laughs> it doesn't matter who we are. We all need Jesus. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 14, wide is the way that leads to destruction. And many there uh, go that, that way. Narrow is the way to life, and few find it. The point is there's a lot of people that are lost and do not even know it. 
The second thing is this. Although there are a lot of people that are lost and they don't know it, they also don't realize the value of their eternal soul. Right. That coin was of great value. And someone was aware of it. You know, ladies and gentlemen, oftentimes I, I talk to people and they feel like they, they, they don't have a value. Mm. I've heard people say, well, I, I don't even deserve to live. Mm -hmm. That's someone tell me the other day, there are people out here that are sick and dying, and here I am alive, and I don't even deserve to be alive. It just doesn't seem fair. Now, that's a, a pretty low opinion of oneself. And there's a lot of people today that have absolutely no value, no self-worth. Well, here's my point, and that is this, that to God you have a worth, you have a value, you're important to God. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. To God, you are important. Now listen, how do I know this? I'll tell you how I know this, because the, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ argues your worth. It shows you just how much God was willing to invest in you. Now you think about that this morning. Jesus Christ went to the cross for who? For you. Amen. If you were the only person on the footstool of God, Jesus Christ would have still gone to the cross and died for you. This woman searched until she found her coin. You know, more often than not, <clears throat> things are lost because of carelessness. You ever lose anything because you were careless, you misplaced it? You weren't even think I'm, well, I tell you, I'm the world's worst. Chris will tell you that. I'm always losing something, right? Well, I'm not going to lose her, though. I'll tell you that. I keep an eye on that one. <laughs> no, sir. The Bible says in Hebrews 2 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. People are careless. They're careless with their life. They're careless with their relationship with God. It was a beautiful, sunshiny day, and the families were enjoying a day on the island along the beach. The island was connected to the main line by a bridge, one single bridge, an iron causeway, and it was the only way off the bridge or off the island. Before long... <clears throat> Someone came along and warned that crowd of people that there was a storm brewing up the coast. But no one seemed very alarmed. No one really seemed to care. Well, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. And then later on, they were told to vacate the island because the storm was getting closer. But again, no one listened. No one paid any attention. They continued to laugh and play and enjoy the day as though there was no danger. They didn't have a care in the world. But then the clouds begin to roll in, the sky turned black, the winds begin to blow, and the waves begin to be angry. And a hurricane showed up. It destroyed the bridge, the only escape. And literally hundreds of people died. Why? Because of neglect. Careless neglect. You know, people get distracted in this world we live in today. It's easy, it's, it's easy to happen. It can happen, I suppose, to, to a lot of people. Hopefully not you. But people get distracted by the things of the world. And, and we don't want to listen to the warning of God's word. The Bible says to make your calling and election sure. Make your salvation sure. Make sure you're saved. Obey the gospel. The people ignore that warning. They go right on with their life. They put other things before God. They think other things are more important than, than reading the Word of God or praying or being in church, or most of all, being saved. You know, this is the very reason why we light the lamp of God's Word when we get in this pulpit. It's why we preach the Word. It's why we preach the Gospel. It's why we preach about the cross. It's why we preach messages of salvation <coughs> about the blood and how you're to obey the Gospel and put your faith in Jesus. 
and repent and confess Christ. Why? You're supposed to be immersed into Christ, buried in that watery grave, because it's there that you come to the foot of the cross and your sins are washed by the blood of the Lamb. This is why that we make sure our, our light is lit as we get in the pulpit and we preach. Or as Christians, we share the gospel with others. This is why we, we get out our spiritual broom and we sweep away the false doctrine, the false teaching. This is why we want to sweep away any kind of seeker-friendly, anything-goes type of a message. We don't want any part of that because it's not true. We want to preach the truth. Pay attention to what the Bible says in 2 Timothy in chapter 4. Look at this. Paul told the young evangelist, the preacher, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, and is appearing in his kingdom. He said, preach what? The word. Preach the Bible. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now get this. He said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. In other words, sound biblical preaching. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Yeah. <coughs> it's a sad day when we turn away from the word of God. We begin to buy into this other stuff. And it's just stuff. If it's not scripture, it doesn't amount to a proverbial hill of beans. What's important is what God said. Remember what Jesus said, man should not live, live, uh, live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If you want to live a life, then you need to obey what the Bible says. We need to, to listen to what the word of God says. And we need to apply it to our life. And then finally, the third thing is this. In verse 13, it says, And not many days after the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Now we're going to talk about the lost boy. Here's a boy that believed that the grass was greener on the other side. How many times? How many times do people buy into this? It reminds me of that story about a little boy by the name of Jimmy. He was on vacation, just a kid with his family, and, and they were out west. And as they're going through the desert out west, all of a sudden, little Jimmy jumps up and said, Look, there's a lake up ahead. His mom said, she says, Jimmy, that's not a lake, that's a mirage. He said, a mirage? What's a mirage? And, and, and his mother, being much older and wiser, she, she defined it by saying, Son, a mirage is something that appears to be something, but it's not. This boy went out into the far country. He thought the grass was greener on the other side. He told his father, he said, give me my inheritance. And the Bible says he went out and he, he wasted it on riotous living. Right. Now, you know, it doesn't take a lot to explain that, does it? There's a lot of people that wasted their life on riotous living. Sensual living. Uh, going out here and doing things they shouldn't do. Things that are going to destroy their life. And they squander their life. I mean, it's, it's, it's every turn we find someone that is doing that. They're journeying out into the far country of sin. And sin is destroying their life. Because they have no regard for God. And so they wander away from that which is good. That which is right. It's a mirage. It's something that appears to be something, but it's not. It's a great lie. It's a great cheat. Again, it's a mirage. And the Bible says, And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. He began to be in want and went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He sent him into the fields to feed the swine and would have fan have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. Do you see what happened? He lost everything he had. He lost his inheritance and now he was starving. He was hungry. How hungry? He was going to eat pig slop. That's a pretty good picture, isn't it? Of what happens in people's lives. But they allow sin to dominate their life. But you know that's not the that's not the end of the story. Even though that story has been played out countless number of times over and over again, the story of a wasted life, a journey into the far country of sin, that's not the end of the story. It's a story of drug addiction. It's a story 
of alcoholism. It's a story of adulterous affairs, of embezzlement, of lies and cheats. It's a story of a wasted life. You know, even a moral life. Did you hear me? I said even a moral life. A lot of people live good moral lives, but they do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They think that morality, that goodness, uh, being a good neighbor, being a good citizen, having good morals is going to save their soul, but that's not true. They've wandered out into that far country. Ladies and gentlemen, without Christ, we're lost. It's that long journey down the dead end road that leads us to hell. Again, that's not the end of the story. The Bible says that he came unto himself. What did he do? He confessed his sin. He said, I've sinned against my Father. I've sinned against heaven. I'm going to go back home. I'm no longer worthy to be called uh, my, my, my Father's son. I, I, I'm just going to go back and tell him I'll be a hired servant. Just hire me on. Give me a job. I'm not worthy because I've sinned. Did you hear that? I'm not worthy. i got news for you. When it comes to, to, to our relationship with God, none of us are worthy. Amen. Amen. We've all Amen. sinned. I don't care who you are, how much you think you are. We've all sinned. Again, the ground's level at the cross. We've all made mistakes. We've all fallen short of God's glory. We're not worthy. But now you're going to see the grace and the mercy of God because that Father, I can just see him, can't you? I bet you every day he was scanning the horizon just waiting for that boy to come over the last hill of the way, just waiting on him to come home. And the day would come, here comes that boy. And when he sees him, the Bible says he runs to him. Mm -hmm. He doesn't walk. Can you imagine how excited you would be? If your son had wandered away out into the far country of sin or your daughter had wandered out into that life, and you see him coming home, you're going to be thrilled to death. Well, that's the heart of God. But then there's the grace and the mercy of God and the love of God. Because when he came back and the boy started his speech, oh, I'm not worthy. I'm telling you what, he threw his arms around that boy. He hugged that boy. He kissed that boy's face. He threw a robe on that boy. He said, my son was lost, but now he's home. That's the heart of God. That's the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, there isn't anything in the world to compare with the mercy and the love and the grace of God. And that's the story of the lost boy. So a lot of people like that lost boy. All they need to do is recognize the fact that they're lost. And they need to come home to God. Come home to God by putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Repenting of their sins, confessing Jesus and being baptized, immersed in that watery grave. Why? So your sins will be washed away by the blood of Jesus, that shed blood from the cross of Calvary. And you'll receive the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. Don't you want to be born again? Don't you want to give your life to Jesus Christ and start that new journey? A journey of hope, a journey of eternal life, a journey knowing that God has you. He has your hand in His hand. And no matter what you go through, He's going to carry you. Amen. I'm going to close with this. There's an old story. I've told it over the years. There's Bible meetings and even here. But it's a story about an old man sitting there in his living room in his rocking chair looking out that big window you can see across the field. He noticed there was a kid, a boy. And he didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know what he was up to. He noticed he had a cage in his hand. He was watching him. And he, he could tell he was pursuing something and finally he could see that he had caught some things and put him in that cage. But the old man, he, he wanted to find out what was going on. So he gets up and walks out. Here comes that boy carrying that cage. He said to that boy, he said, Son, he said, what do you got? He said, oh, not much, mister. He got me some old field birds. He said, old field birds? He said, oh, yeah, just dirty old birds. He said, what are you going to do with them? He said, well, take them home. I'm going to play with them. The old man looked at him. He said, well, boy, that's going to get old. Then what are you going to do with them? He said, well, I got a cat. 
I reckon I'm going to get into that cat. The old man, he said to him, he said, boy, how much you take for those, those pearls? I'll buy them from you. You name your price. The boy said, mister, you don't want these birds. They can't even sing. They're dirty. They're just old field birds. You don't want them. He said, boy, how much do you want for the birds? The little fellow scratched his head. Oh, I'll give you a few dollars. He thought, they'll never give you that. Sure enough, the old man reached in his tattered old billfold, pulled out three $1 bills, and he handed them to the boy. The boy gave him the birds in the bird cage and off he went and scampered down the road. Feeling like he made a pretty good deal. To the fact that he didn't even notice what the old man was doing. He took the bird cage and he opened the door. And he set him free. <laughs> it was a small price for him, I suppose, to see those birds free. But you know, I think about that story and I think about this. What would a conversation sound like? What would a conversation be like? If, if Jesus were talking to the, the devil himself, and he said to the devil, he said, devil, what you got there? And maybe the devil would say something like, well, I got a world full of people. A world full of people. He said, what are you doing with them? He said, oh, he said, I've got them lying and cheating and, 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 and just hating each other. He said, I've got them just I'm manipulating them, doing all kinds of things with them, having fun with them. And Jesus says to him, Satan, that's going to get old. Yeah. Then what are you going to do with them? And the old devil, he looks at Jesus. And he said, well, I reckon I'll just damn them to hell. Thank you. 